All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, and welcome to the first program in our webinar series, which is brought to you by Georgia Home Place, an initiative of the Georgia Public Library Service. Today's webinar is titled Building Collections, Making Connections, Donor Relations, and Archival Acquisitions in Public Libraries. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be made available in both the GPLS Learning Center, which is at learning.georgialibraries.org, and our YouTube stream at youtube.com forward slash user forward slash Georgia Public Library. These links will be emailed to all participants once the recording is available. Continuing education credit is available for those participants that require it. Please contact Dustin Landrum at dlandrum at georgialibraries.org to request a certificate. My name is Angela Stanley, and I am director of Georgia Home Place. We are so pleased to be able to bring you this series on managing public library archives and special collections. Before we turn to today's program, I would like to quickly familiarize everyone with the WebEx webinar program. You can use the control panel to make modifications to your audio settings. If you'd like, you can also hide the control panel with the arrow at the top of your screen. All attendees are automatically muted by the program, but you can communicate and ask questions during the webinar through the chat and or the Q&A boxes, which I will be monitoring. Shorter questions will be addressed during the webinar as time allows, and Matt will answer any in-depth questions following the presentation. I'd like to take a moment to briefly share some information about HomePlace and the Digital Library of Georgia. HomePlace is an acronym standing for Providing Library and Archives Collections Electronically. Georgia HomePlace encourages public libraries and related institutions across the state of Georgia to participate in the Digital Library of Georgia through digital projects, trainings, and consultations. HomePlace is made possible through the support of LSTA funds administered by the Institute for Museum and Library Services. The Digital Library of Georgia is a Galileo initiative based at the University of Georgia Libraries that collaborates with Georgia's libraries, archives, museums, and other institutions of education and culture to provide access to key information resources on Georgia history, culture, and life. This primary mission is accomplished through the ongoing development, maintenance, and preservation of digital collections and online digital library resources. Please visit our websites at georgialibraries.org slash homeplace and dlg.galileo.usg.edu for more details. If you'd like to subscribe to the DLG's listserv, through which the partner newsletter is distributed quarterly, please visit bit.ly forward slash DLG news. These links will also be posted to the chat box shortly. We have some exciting upcoming events that I'd like to let you know about. GPLS and DLG will be at the Galileo Annual Conference tomorrow in Columbus. Dorcas Davis, Director of Continuing Education and Training for GPLS, will be sharing information about the Learning Center, which will be one of the resources for accessing this webinar recording. Sheila McAllister, Director of the DLG, will be talking about DLG projects for the upcoming fiscal year. Seats are still available and registration is free Visit usg.edu forward slash Galileo forward slash conference for details. On August 17th, 2017, at 2 p.m., Carrie Heintz, Head of Collection Services at Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Manuscripts, Archives, and Rare Book Library, will be presenting a webinar on reappraisal and deaccessioning of public library archival collections. Heintz will discuss best practices and professional standards in the disposition of collections with a specific focus on ways to adapt these practices for public library staff. She will also discuss ethical and donor relations considerations. Registration information will be coming soon and we certainly hope you can join us. If you have a question about the webinar series or are interested in offering a presentation that would benefit public librarians managing archives and special collections, 
please send me an email at astanley at georgialibraries.org. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Matt Darby is archivist and head of arrangement and description for the Richard B. Russell Library for Political Research and Studies at the UGA Special Collections Libraries. He also serves as curator of the Georgia Disability History Archive. During his nearly 20 years as an archivist, he has worked to build collections documenting diverse communities, politics, and social movements, and corporate institutions. His experience and acquisitions has connected him with donors of all types with a wide range of requirements and expectations. Matt holds an MLIS from the University of Texas at Austin and previously worked as an archivist with UT Austin's Briscoe Center for American History, the Lower Col Colorado River Authority, Hardy Heck Moore Inc., which is a cultural resource management firm, and the Lakeway Texas Heritage Center. Professionally, he has held leadership positions in the Society of Southwest Archivists and the Society of Georgia Archivists and currently serves on the Best Practices Committee of the Society of American Archivists Acquisitions and Appraisal Section. And now I'm going to hand it over to Matt for pr today's presentation, so just bear with me for one moment. All right, Matt, take it Let's away. See. Okay. All right. Hopefully, everyone can see my first slide here. Uh, thank you, Angela, and good afternoon, everyone. As she mentioned, I am Matt Darby, the head of arrangement description at the Russell Library here at UGA. Uh, first off, I think, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, I should let you all know that I've never worked in a public library setting. I have primarily worked in special collections at academic institutions. But at the Russell Library, we have worked both formally and informally with public librarians on various projects, such as creating public displays of archival materials, assisting in developing oral history programs, and consulting on the management of archival collections. So while we exist in a uh, large academic institution and the scope of our collections cover the entire state, part of our mission is to be aware of what is happening in communities across Georgia and assist where we can in the important work of documenting local history. So what, what is it that I can tell you about archival acquisitions in public libraries? Well, I can tell you what I know based on my experience in building collections, and that is the fact that collection development is challenging. You may lack confidence that you're doing the right thing, whether accepting or declining a collection that is offered to you. And saying no to a donor can be hard to do. So that donor could be standing right in front of you with their boxes of letters, ledgers, photographs, et cetera, that they believe have a lot of historical value. And they likely know more about the subject of their materials than you do. Uh, but the fact is that not every old thing that someone has belongs in an archives or history collection. In other words, the age of something doesn't necessarily give it historical value. And it certainly doesn't necessarily make it right for your library. Another issue that you might be facing is that you may not feel you have the authority to decline something. Uh, and by saying no, you risk alienating a library patron and a member of your community. So that's an issue. Um, so uh, Angela, I guess we were going to run a poll now. Is that something yeah. we're going to do? Yes. Okay. And let uh, me, um, when you're ready, I can go ahead and open that. Yeah, so to get a sense of uh, who our participants are today and what your situations may, might be like at your institution, we're going to run a, a brief poll, so we will do that uh, right now. We'll keep that open for another 15 seconds. And three more seconds. 
Okay, let me share those results. Okay, can you all see those? Looks like we only uh, had about 15 people participate. Are you able to see the results, Matt? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay, so it looks like uh, it's, it's sort of a mix. There is uh, quite a few people who are from public libraries. Um, there are, let's see, some people are using um, collection development policies and deeds of gift, which is uh, which is which is good to see. Um, I'll be going into a, a, a number of the issues here, um, but that that gives me an idea of kind of where we are in terms of who's participating with us today. Um, and, and I can just close out of this poll now, Angela. Yeah, that'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. All right, so moving on. Um, so based on what I know from you know this quick poll and from uh, my colleagues at public libraries, many of you are faced with just some of these challenges when it comes to archival collections. At your library, you may not be proactively collecting by going out and seeking archival materials from your community. Acquiring archival collections may simply not be a defined part of your library's mission or one of the priorities for serving your patrons, and that's okay. Nevertheless, many of you instead are forced to be reactive, fielding offers of archival materials as patrons come to you. In addition, even if you're not actively collecting, you may have at least partial responsibility for managing what we'll call legacy collections. And by that, I mean those collections that uh, you already have, and you may have had those for a long time, and perhaps not much has been done with those. Uh, these collections could be relatively small, or you may have inherited responsibility for large, uh, undefined collections that have been accumulated over many years. Uh, and these collections represent the work of former library staff and community donors. In many cases, your local history collections may have started by accident, or at least unintentionally. Uh, some local history collections I know about uh, started as the result of a big initial donation uh, a member of the community uh, included uh, included it in uh, her will, and it became sort of the founding uh, collection of the library. Or in, in most cases, which may be the case, your materials have trickled in over time. If your predecessors lacked uh, experience in the area of archives, they may have accepted material for a variety of reasons. Uh, administrative decisions that were kind of out of their control, uh, pressure from the public, uh, and, and again, going back to that feeling that they just couldn't say no to a particular donor. Uh, these collect collections can be difficult to manage for all sorts of factors, uh, lack of staff time and financial resources at the library that, that you have to devote to archival tasks, uh, uncertainty about what exactly the collections that you have are, and the inability to provide appropriate access to the collections. So if you feel like you want to get out of this reactive mode and working with potential donors, it's important for you to develop a policy that allows you to say yes when you want to uh, regarding a collection and politely say no when you do not. If your library has been around for a long time, you may really be feeling the burden of what you have. Uh, you could be facing some or all of these issues, uh, relatively large number of collections and you know, obviously large is a relative term, but, it, but if it feels like a lot to you, it's probably a lot. Um, an undefined collection scope, collections of all types and subjects with no real intentional connection among them, uh, unorganized and possibly unidentified collections, and uh, an issue we see a lot of, uh, a lack of, a, of documentation for collections. Who donated the materials? Where did they come from? And how long have you had them? So my objective today is really to provide some ideas and tools to help you navigate those interactions with patron donors. I'm going to discuss the need for a good collecting policy to, to, uh, which should guide your decision-making about what to gladly accept and politely decline. 
I'll talk about some of the keys to building good relationships with your donors, and I'll touch on some ways to manage new collections and those existing legacy collections. So before we go any further, I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, some of the ethical considerations of archival collecting. When accepting a collection, you are obligating your library to the long-term preservation and management of that collection. It seems obvious, but it's, it's, it's worth reiterating. And your library should be prepared to commit adequate resources to managing those collections. Access to collections is of paramount importance, and you're going to hear me say that again and again. If you accept a collection, you should always be thinking about providing access to it and who the users of that collection might be. And of course, if you are entering into a relationship with your donors, many of whom come to you with their own ideas and expectations, managing that relationship and those expectations is going to be key. So let's talk about policy. What are some of the benefits of collecting policy? So whether you call it a collecting policy, a collection development policy, or an acquisition policy, it is incredibly important that you have something that helps guide your collecting. If your library doesn't have a policy in place uh, that governs archival materials already, and judging from our poll, uh, many of you may not, um, developing one should be a high priority. Uh, a written collecting policy will help you define the scope of what you want your collections to be, and should really drive everything you do in shaping and building your local history collection. Even if acquiring more collections is not your top priority, the collecting policy can really help you guide, help guide you in retroactively about evaluating the collections you already have. And for administrators of libraries, library directors, it's a way to um, think about halting the influx of non-essential materials into the library that have the potential to eat up value res valuable resources uh, that you may not have. And of course, while the policy will serve as a helpful tool for you and other library staff, the policy is meant to be an important public document that you can point to to provide guidance and, and, and frankly, justification to, uh, to potential donors. And ultimately, it allows you to communicate confidently with the donor, knowing that there is a policy that backs up the decision. Now, I suspect that some of you uh, who don't have a collect, uh, collection development policy may find the prospect of drafting one quite daunting. But I'll let you in on a little secret. Not all archives have good or adequate collecting policies. Uh, and this includes academic institutions, public libraries, historical societies, and, and other entities. Um, so, so let's look at some of the elements to include in your collecting policy. Because collecting is at the core of what archivists do, I think it's important that a collecting policy takes a holistic approach that considers not just what you're collecting, but makes clear how the what of collecting affects the other aspects of what you may do as a library with local history collection. So you'll see here that I've borrowed liberally from the five W's of journalism as a way to begin thinking about what makes up the elements of a good collecting policy. You want to include uh, some aspect of the following. Why are you collecting? What are you collecting? Who makes decisions about what you collect? Where will the collections be managed and made available for use? When are you collecting? Are you active, actively collecting or are you taking a hold from collecting? Uh, and, and importantly, how can one donate to your collection? And again, keep in mind, this is meant to be a public document designed to let your patrons know what you collect and what you do. So I'm gonna start off with uh, why, you, why you collect. Uh, whether you have collections already or are considering starting a local history collection program, the first question you should be asking is why collect or title material? And I included the why here before the what because it is critical for public libraries to consider carefully whether collecting archival materials is implicit in your library's mission to serve the community. As public librarians, you are interacting with your community every day. 
have you identified an unmet need among your patrons with regard to uh, historical collections? If you don't know, uh, you can find out, poll or survey your patrons. I have a feeling you may know specific uh, patrons to reach out to already. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and I'll say it again, archives are meant to be used and a good rationale for collecting is to serve those patrons and the knowledge that the collections will be used is critical. If you have a user community that is hungry for archival research, determine what those needs are and whether as a library you are prepared to meet those needs through an archives program. But if you ask yourself why, and the answer is because we think we should, because history is important, that frankly may not be a good enough reason. Not every place can or should collect archives. With the uh, particular pressures of a public library environment, with potentially limited staff, uh, financial resources and time uh, to devote to archives might not be there. You should be making solid justification for creating or continuing an archival program. So if you've answered the why and have decided that an archives program is right for your library, you're really ready to start thinking about what you are collecting. For public libraries, this might seem obvious, but the, the answer to this question is the crux of your policy, so it deserves considerable thought and deliberation. Too often, archivists and librarians don't consider this uh, policy carefully enough, or they don't want to be hemmed in by what they see as a too restrictive policy. They like the idea of it being uh, sort of fluid. And some may suffer from what I'll uh, sort of call, uh, for lack of a better word, archival FOMO, fear of missing out, the idea that a collection is just too good not to take, even if it has nothing to do with your collecting policy or uh, the, the environment in, in, in which you find yourself. So what should you collect? That's a tough question. Because of the nature of archives, I can't tell you exactly what to collect. Every policy should be specific to your library. And you will certainly know your community and potential users better than anyone else. A good starting point, I think, is to establish criteria and parameters for that collecting. As a public library, it just makes sense for you to think local. And you should define local as best suits you and your patrons' needs. It could mean simply your town or city, uh, the city and the county, or a multi-county region. And it could even be defined by the geographic service area of your particular library. You will also want to consider the specific types of entities or creators you want to document in your collection. Uh, these should be familiar to many of you, but I'll just go through them. Uh, families and family collections, uh, individual members of the community, uh, businesses and nonprofits, uh, clubs and associations such as the Garden Club, the Rotary Club, service organizations, and of course religious communities such as churches, mosques, temples in your area, uh, and other, uh, other things throughout the community. Something else to consider, of course, is what types of archival materials you want to collect. Uh, for family records and personal papers, you might uh, want to consider some of the following examples. And this, of course, this is by no means comprehensive, but these are the sorts of things that often show up in, in uh, these types of collections. And for business and organizational records, here's a few examples. Uh, particularly with organizations, uh, meeting minutes are often key to documenting the activities of those organizations. Um, and so these are just you know, some quick lists of material that may have in your collections already or that may find their way to you um, uh, for you to consider. So ideally, in, in thinking about this policy and describing what you collect, you want to avoid they catch all policy statements that lack enough detail to be meaningful. Here's an example. We collect material documenting the history of X county and the surrounding area. 
frankly, this probably is not good enough. The policy statement sets parameters, but it still encompasses more than you might be willing and able to accept. So the more detailed your collection development policy is, the better prepared you will be to articulate to a potential donor whether their collection is right for your library. Uh, in developing your policy, you should also consider what other institutions in your area may be collecting. Investigate the collecting policies of local universities and colleges, historical societies, find out what records are being uh, maintained at uh, courthouses, county clerks, and others. Uh, as much as possible, try to set yourself apart from these other institutions when you uh, determine what you're collecting. Um, and whenever you can, avoid competing with these institutions for, uh, for collection. Uh, in practice, this can be difficult, but um, it's not impossible. And so by carving out your niche in the collecting environment, it'll help you focus uh, on the collections that you really want, you'll best serve your users, and you'll um, not expend uh, unnecessary resources in doing so. Angela, have any uh, questions come in through the chat so far? No, not yet, but um, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to post them in the chat box or in the Q&A section, and I will be sure to um, ask them when we have time. Okay, I will continue on. All right, so where were we? What are you collecting? Okay. Uh, Frankly, it can also be helpful to, to include a, a list of things you do not collect. Uh, for your sake, I would include in that list non-archival items as well. Uh, donors invari invariably bring some of these along, thinking they may be valuable additions to your collection, um, when in fact there are things that, that, that you don't really want. So I would consider very carefully before accepting uh, some, some of these materials uh, I'll list just a few. Uh, major national newspapers and magazines, such as the New York Times or Life magazine, uh, issues of local or re regional newspapers for, for which microfilm already exists. Many of you are probably familiar with the Georgia Newspaper Project, which is uh, still microfilming newspapers uh, at the University of Georgia, and the Digital Library of Georgia's uh, Georgia Historic Newspapers, which is digitizing uh, pre-1923 papers. Um, another thing we often see are large amounts of photocopies, particularly of uh, archival material from other institutions. Um, while they may have been important to an individual's research, oftentimes you're really taking on uh, material that is from another institution, even if it's just a copy. Um, and this might be a, a controversial opinion, uh, and it depends on the capabilities of your particular library. Uh, but I think you really want to consider uh, uh, whether or not you want to accept audiovisual materials and digital files. Uh, this is by no means to suggest that these types of machine readable formats are not worth collecting. Uh, we live in a digital world uh, and these are the types of things people are collecting. Um, but again, uh, unless you are prepared to invest in the equipment and the staff necessary to preserve this kind of material, you may want to decline these uh, kinds of materials outright or collect very selectively. Other things, uh, let's see, artifacts and museum type items. Uh, you know, anything from arrowheads, plaques, uh, tools, clothing. Uh, I, I'm sure you've seen them all, I know I have. Again, these can be in, important collections uh, to someone's collection, they just might not be uh, right for your library. Um, and this is also maybe another unpopular opinion. Uh, photographic material that, that lacks uh, context and adequate description. Uh, if neither you nor the donor has any idea what these photographs uh, represent, it may be best uh, to decline them. On the other hand, if you have someone in your community who can assist with identifying and providing context for those images, then the photos may be worth you know, reconsidering. But those, those are some things to think about. Uh, something I know that uh, a lot of local history collections do are they, uh, they've set up uh, 
vertical files or subject files that are really good to accommodate small number of items that people might uh, want to give to the library that may not be part of a larger collection, but really uh, do document aspects of the uh, um, aspects of the community, such as uh, you know, programs from, from events, uh, brochures, things of that nature that can be added to such uh, such uh, vertical file collection. So next, uh, now that you've really looked at the what of your collecting, uh, now let's talk about who in your library has responsibility for collecting. Maybe it's uh, uh, maybe it's you that are participating today, or maybe it's someone else. As part of your collecting policy, I, rec I recommend including language that explains how decisions are made regarding potential donations. You should establish who in your library has both the authority and responsibility for accepting and declining offered collections. Will this be a single staff person? Will it be a small group? Should your library director be involved in this process? There's a number of ways to approach this. You may even want to consider creating uh, something like an acquisitions committee to collectively evaluate what is being offered. This helps spread the work and the responsibility and involves others in the process. Um, I've seen um, uh, I've seen situations where uh, such a committee would be a good way to collaborate with a knowledgeable uh, community member in building useful collections. There are bound to be um, enthusiastic patrons that would be uh, that would jump at the chance to be involved in such a process. Um, but regardless of how your library makes these decisions, all collection decisions should adhere closely to what your policy outlines. So where will the collections be managed and used? Uh, I sound like a broken record, but I'll say it again. Uh, your policy should emphasize that your collection will eventually be used by patrons for research. You should explain generally the rules and procedures that patrons must follow when conducting research with collections at your library. You should convey what security measures and rules are in place to protect collections. Uh, ideally, collections uh, should be stored in a closed stacks area, uh, staff only area if possible. Uh, you should also convey in your policy what happens to collections after they are donated. Another thing to consider uh, when developing your policy, when are you collecting? Are you actively collecting now? Uh, will your library be seeking out collections? And will you be evaluating collections as they are offered? Uh, some would argue that a reactive approach does not necessarily make for good archives, but it certainly is an option you can employ if necessary. For example, your policy may dictate that you collect the records of local businesses. But let's say this year in 2017, given your current staffing levels and other resources, you're going to prioritize collecting, uh, prioritize collecting the records of religious communities in your area. Now, this doesn't mean that you might not uh, consider local business records if offered, but setting priorities on an annual basis to focus on particular kinds of collections is a perfectly reasonable strategy for an archival program. And frankly, not enough archives take this approach, which can help fill in noticeable gaps in your collections when you find them. It can help you from feeling uh, overwhelmed by the wealth of records and papers that exist in your community. And then lastly, considering this policy, how does one donate collections? That, that should be part of this policy. Um, you're going to want to outline the procedures for donating, who is the primary point of contact for archival collection. Uh, you'll want to explain that all donors are required to complete the deed of gift, which is a donor agreement. Um, if you don't want to accept unsolicited collection, say so. If you don't want to accept uh, boxes dropped off at your circulation desk, uh, say so and indicate what will happen to those kinds of, of you know, almost abandoned collections. Uh, and given that many of you are not dedicated full time to archives, uh, you may want to set up something uh, akin to office hours or a specific time each week when you will 
meet with potential donors to field requests and review collection. Uh, this by appointment only model, I think will go a long way with helping you manage your time and keeping you from having to drop whatever else you're doing to meet with an unexpected donor. Uh, quickly, I wanted to uh, point out a uh, part of the collecting policy that I quite like, which is a uh, policy from the uh, Columbus Lounge uh, Public Library, which is in Mississippi. Uh, this is part of a multi-page document that includes many of the features uh, I've discussed thus far. Uh, and I will provide a, a complete copy of uh, this document after today's webinar. Uh, so don't feel like you have to uh, take notes of, of everything. Uh, in this first paragraph, the library makes clear that they are actively collecting. They're encouraging community members to contact them. Uh, further on, they provide a general overview of the types of archival materials they collect, the types of entities they want to document. Uh, the last bullet point there, uh, let's see, the last bullet point there is, is pretty far reaching, but they've also included the important notion of inclusivity, that they are interested in, in, doc in documenting the entirety of the county, not just a small subset of the community, and including members of the community who, who may not always be well documented in archival collections. And then the next paragraph talks about the deed of gifts and transferring, transferring your property to the local history department. It also mentions their willingness to help the donor find a place for the collection elsewhere if it is a collection you won't accept. And it also discusses the transfer of intellectual property rights to the library, as well as other stipulations that would show up in a donor agreement. Later on in this document, another section I quite like. They accept donations because uh, these donations support its mission while also recognizing that what they decide to accept now may not over time prove as useful as first decided. The library has reserved the right to reevaluate collections if necessary. That is a very smart thing to do and to put it out there in writing and to uh, let your donors know that that's a possibility I think is, is very important. It's this type of transparency in the policy and the process that in the long run, I think, will be beneficial for the health of your library and the relationship that you have with donors and patrons. And so thinking about cultivating these good relationships with donors, um, you know, I, want, I want to give a, a brief example of what one might look like. How, how can this contribute to del uh, developing good relationships with the donors? Uh, working with donors and building collections requires a number of things from you. Uh, patience, knowledge of your institution's capabilities. A thing that I always strive for is a, a fair amount of diplomacy. Um, some of these, frankly, are soft skills that if you don't have them innately, you will learn to hone them over time. Um, hopefully, uh, by having a collecting policy in place, you are demonstrating to your interested patrons that you are taking the responsibility of collecting archives seriously while also balancing your library's other needs. And you ultimately reserve the right to do what is best for your library and all of the people that you serve. As I mentioned earlier, finding a way to bring your patrons in, into the discussion of what to collect can go a long way in conveying that this local history collection has their interests and needs in mind. And so reaching out to those patrons and potential donors, I think, is very important. Um, a community-driven approach also has the potential to reach a wider swath of your local area that might not otherwise uh, be documented. And then the thing that maybe you know, some of us out there dread, I know I have on occasion. Uh, so let's step back and consider how to have that conversation with the donor. Uh, the one you might not really want to have. Uh, in, in many ways, declining a collection is just as important as accepting one. Um, I always say that there are, um, in acquiring collections, the, the two most important words are yes and no. Um, because when you do say no thank, thank you, you hopefully are doing so with the knowledge that you have made a decision based on sound policy. So, 
when you're declining a collection, whether it's an individual making that decision or uh, you know a small group of staff members, uh, this, the decision should be articulated clearly and respectfully to the potential donor, explaining specifically why the collection falls outside the scope of your library's policy. A simple no, we don't want it, won't suffice. The donor is going to feel much better about the process if he or she is given an explanation for the library not wanting the collection. And you always have the option of suggesting other institutions that may be interested. Uh, with that idea in mind, I think it's a good policy to always refer uh, uh, donors that have collections that you don't want to other repositories and institutions. Uh, certainly keep a list of institutions in your immediate area to which you can refer donors. Uh, if you decide not to accept something that's happened to us here at the Russell Library quite a bit. Um, the University System of Georgia has 30 institutions across the state, many of which have active archival collection programs, and they may be an option for uh, sending a donor to. Uh, another uh, group to reach out to is the Society of Georgia Archivists. It's an excellent way to reach archivists at a variety of institutions throughout the state including non-academic repositories. Uh, and it goes without saying, uh, you will make important contacts in the archival profession in Georgia if you can help you in the work that you are doing. Uh, so let's think about the, the, sort of the flip side of this, the alternative. Uh, you have uh, not declined a collection, but have decided to happily accept a new acquisition. You've met with the donor, you have decided that her collection is exactly the type of material uh, you'd like to collect for your library. Uh, now what? Uh, first, the donor and the appropriate library representative must sign a deed of gift for donor agreement. Uh, this donor agreement should be signed at the time of acquisition. If there is any negotiation needed between you and the donor regarding the deed of gift, it's best to hold off on transferring that material to the library until an agreement can be reached. Uh, this agreement is a legally binding contract between the library and the donor. Uh, it transfers physical ownership of the materials to the library. And also often, it transfers intellectual property rights that the donor has in the material to the library. This is an idea, such, ideal situation which allows you to do much more with the content of that collection if you so choose. Um, the deed of gift should identify each party's responsibility. Uh, it outlines any restrictions or special, special considerations that uh, the collection may have. For example, a donor may request that certain materials be closed for a set period of time. Um, also, if the library is interested in uh, wanting to provide access to parts of this collection to a digital project, uh, it's good to include that in the deed of gift uh, at the time of the sign up. And ideally, the, the deed of gift also includes language, uh, as we saw in the, uh, uh, the Columbus uh, Library uh, document. The deed of gift should include language that allows the library to reevaluate the collection in the future and the option of returning uh, those items to the donor if the collection policy changes. And importantly, the deed of gift should also serve to establish a sense of trust between you and the donor really help you manage the donor's expectations about what will happen to her collection now and in the future. So this this image uh, looks to be a little fuzzy, but it's, uh, uh, and I'll be sharing some of these uh, with you after the webinar. And here are some examples of donor agreements and forms that uh, we are using at the Russell Library and at EGA Special Collections. Uh, this first document is a uh, relatively straightforward deed of gift that we use. Um, depending on who our donor is, they can get, uh, particularly with uh, members of Congress, they can, they can get uh, a little more detailed. But uh, each paragraph here focuses on a specific function and, and, and purpose. And I'm, I'm going to take you just briefly uh, through it. Uh, paragraph one, it really identifies the parties to the agreement, the donor and the Russell Library. Uh, paragraph two indicates that the donor is transferring ownership of the material as well as intellectual property rights to the library. Excuse me. Paragraph three discusses preservation, 
storage and accessibility. And also points out that, and, and this is something that comes up a lot, the donor is often concerned about once it's donated, will they have access to the material? And of course, that is something we always include, that they uh, are able to access the material if they, if they need to. Uh, paragraph four discusses what we do in the event that uh, uh, we determine that we, we no longer want some of the material in the collection. We offer it back to them uh, first. Uh, paragraph five allows us uh, to let others know that we have the collection, even if it may not immediately be available for research use. Uh, moving on to paragraph six, uh, this is one that you would expect uh, to see in a document of this sort, which uh, relieves the university of any liability should the collection be lost or damaged due to deterioration or a fire or some other catastrophe. Uh, and lastly, paragraph seven allows for future additions to this collection be covered by this initial deed of gift. So if you are entering into this long-term uh, relationship with the donor, and, and uh, some of us uh, probably have where they give us uh, you know, small caches of material over time, uh, this is a deed of gift that covers all future additions to the collection. And then of course, uh, the signatures of the parties involved. Uh, just a side note, one thing I have seen many times over the years uh, particularly working with family members uh, in donating papers of their uh, mother or father, uh, that um, all of the siblings want to be included as donors of the collection. So I've seen deeds of gift with as many as six, seven siblings uh, signing off on the donation. And they really sort of consider it a tribute uh, to uh, their uh, parents to be able to do that. <coughs> And then briefly, I'll show you uh, another document that we use, what we call a gift in kind form. Uh, this is a good option to use for when a donor may be dropping off material uh, material uh, to be evaluated further and considered further by uh, uh, whether, again, whether it's an individual or a, an acquisitions committee. Uh, this form really documents the library's receipt of the materials, captures uh, very basic information about the collection. It provides a quick overview of some of our policies. If we do end up accepting the collection, then we move forward and draft a more formal deed of gift for the donor. And then this is just a uh, second page of, the, of that document. And so then moving on to thinking about how to document your new donation. So you've, you've done the deed of gift, uh, everything's squared away there, the donor seems happy. Uh, now internally you need to uh, uh, go about uh, managing those materials that you uh, brought in. The collection now belongs to the library and you can move forward. Uh, this next step is what archivists call accessioning. And, and really an accession is the discrete unit of materials that you've just accepted for the library. You know, for example, uh, three boxes of the Smythe family papers, uh, correspondence from 1948 to 1953. Uh, and it's worth noting, uh, going back to that idea of future uh, donation, uh, one collection can end up having multiple uh, accessions over time um, and can be added to the, the larger collection. At its most basic, um, accessioning is the process of recording information about a donation. The time of the, uh, at the time of the donation is really the best opportunity you have to record solid information about the collection. Uh, you've been able to talk with the donor about what they have. Uh, you can provide an overview, a description of what you've received. Uh, obviously, you record the, uh, the donor's name uh, and when you received it. So many repositories have collection management systems for archival collections, such as Archivist Toolkit, Archive Space, that help you document and track your accession. But if your library budget doesn't allow for something like that, you can very easily document your accession using a spreadsheet, which can serve as uh, something like an accession register. Uh, I've taken a, a screenshot here to, to show you some potential uh, entries 
uh, for your sessions. Uh, I will include an example of these documents uh, after the webinar, but let's look at some of these fields. Uh, so you'll see on the far left an accession number. That's really just the unique number assigned to an accession. Uh, repositories use a number of systems to come up with this number. Uh, at the Russell Library, we keep it relatively simple. The first four digits indicate the year we received the accession. The next two digits uh, represent the order in which the accession was received in that year. So 2017 slash 23 is the 23rd accession uh, this year. Uh, the other fields are relatively straightforward to constitute the substance of the accession. And of course, if you find that there's other information your library wants to include, you can modify the spreadsheet as needed. Uh, and given the demands on your time, having a simple way to track your donations and having all of them listed in one place is a, is a really important first step in managing your acquisition. Let's see. So once you've completed the entry for your donation in the accession register, be sure to label the boxes with the assigned accession number, uh, since it uh, could be some time before you or a colleague are able to return to that collection. Uh, if you are able, you can go one step further and create an accession inventory that describes very generally the contents of each box, so a, a box level inventory, something a little more detailed than what's in the accession register. Uh, but not as detailed as uh, a folder inventory might be. Uh, and with some collections, this may be a good enough stopgap measure to help you manage your collection until further work can be undertaken. And I should note here, this is also a part of the process that really begs for uh, a donor or a volunteer to participate and assist in this process. Uh, and, and on a number of occasions, you know, there'd be nothing wrong with requiring the donor to provide an inventory as a stipulation in accepting a collection. The more that uh, you can work with the donor to get the information that you need, the better off you will be down the road. So thinking about evaluating, so we, we, we talked about uh, new collections and, and, and how to deal with that, dealing with the DWF, but what about evaluating uh, existing collections, those legacy collections uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, so taking a good broad survey of your existing collection will help you determine a number of things. What have you collected in the past? Uh, whether you should continue to collect this material going forward, and whether you have that on closer inspection might not really be right for a local history collection in your library. Um, it sounds like an upcoming uh, webinar is going to get into uh, the issue of uh, reappraisal and deaccessioning, so I won't go into too much detail there, but you know, that's something that uh, a collection survey could certainly uh, assist you in, in figuring out. Um, so uh, in, in, in jumping into evaluating your existing collection, the good first question to ask yourself is, do you know what you have and where is it located? Um, at places I've worked, that's not always a simple, uh, a simple uh, answer. Uh, depending on the size of your facility, the age of your facility, uh, archival materials could be squirreled away just about anywhere. Um, depending on the volume of ar archival material you have, this could take you know, an afternoon or uh, much, much longer to track everything down. Uh, so what information do you already have about your collection? There's bound to be at least something that, that helps you uh, understand what you have. Uh, for libraries that have been co collecting for a long time, there may, there may be existing collection records that you can refer to. More recent collections uh, might be possible to uh, search through files, uh, emails. Uh, results might turn something up. Throughout this process, you want to take advantage of institutional memory, uh, particularly if you have not been there for a very long period of time, but others uh, on your staff have. Uh, and some of you may have uh, uh, may have finding aids or guides to collections that have already been processed, which uh, you know puts you in a a, uh, a, a good situation to uh, really identify the collections that need uh, very little work, and then the collections that need 
quite a bit of work. So in conducting your collection survey, you will want to record whatever information you may have about your collection, even if it's incomplete. Uh, I will make available to you an example of a simple survey spreadsheet that can help you organize and make, uh, manage this process. Once you have conducted a collection survey, and keep in mind it could take a while, you will have such a, you know, a much better understanding of what you have. Um, and you'll be surprised you know, what you find out. Um, you can check collections against your you know, newly minted collection development policy uh, and identify what fits well, what falls out of scope, where are the gaps in your collecting. Uh, and, and this will all work to help guide your collecting in the future should you, you know, choose to, uh, choose to uh, do that. Um, and also the hands-on work of the collection survey, actually pulling a box off the shelf and looking into it. Uh, this means you have the opportunity to physically handle the materials and get a sense of their condition. Um, you can determine if there are materials that have any preservation concerns, um, are there things there that are harmful to collections, uh, are, are some just too far to be gone, uh, far, too far gone to be saved. Some examples of that include molding materials, um, uh, things that are you know, just disintegrating. Uh, some of those could be isolated and maybe dealt with uh, in some way, uh, but in some cases, you know, uh, some things may just need to be discarded. You're going to run into, you know, old newspapers and uh, acidic pulp-based papers could be crumbling and unusable. And and really, it's important to, to remember that these sorts of uh, condition issues can pose threats to other items in the collection, to mold growth and uh, an active transfer. So, Matt, so, we, did have a, we did have a quick question. Um, well, that's, that, that's good, because I'm just about wrapped up. Oh, all right. Yeah, I, I think we're at the top of the hour. So the question was, um, if you could describe a little bit better uh, what a, a linear foot is and, and what that specifically refers to in terms of shelf space. Okay, so a linear foot, uh, the way we look at it, uh, uh, and, and and interestingly, I've I've worked at a number of institutions that 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 treat this differently, but I think that the, the major standard is that a a banker's box, if you're familiar with you know, what those look like, um, those boxes tend to, on the short side they tend to be one foot. Uh, um, a linear foot uh, that way, and that's that's how we determine our um, our uh, sizing and uh, evaluating the sizes of collections here. Um, some institutions use cub cubic feet. Uh, the banker's box is a, is a cubic foot, um, but there are boxes, for example, that are you know, half that size, um, a quarter of that size, and so. Um, and the other thing that, to think about too in determining uh, the size of collections is um, you're likely to receive materials in um, non-standard boxes that um, that until you're able to, uh, if you're not able to get the archival supplies that you need, you may just have to stay in those boxes for the time being until you can do uh, more work with them. And I just shared, um, you're probably familiar with this, the, the Beinecke linear foot calculator. Yes, yes. So that should be in the chat box if anybody wants to take a look at that. All right, so Matt, we have a comment of thank you and that this has been a really helpful overview of the process and best practices. Okay, uh, glad to hear. <laughs> And uh, if anybody else has um, any other questions, now's the time. I think this was a, a great presentation, and I think you've given us all a lot to think about as we consider our own institutions, current and future collections. Um, and, and anybody else? Go ahead. No, I was just going to say. I think. I think. I think the thing to uh, you know keep in mind for everyone you know participating today is. Um, you know, you may feel like in your institution that um, uh, you know these are things you can't possibly uh, you know undertake. But I think if you do it incrementally and start 
you know, start small, whether it's, okay, I'm going to tackle, you know, the uh, collections on this, you know, these two shelves, you know, and that may be all you get to for a while, uh, but you're making, you know, you're making a dent, you're, you're doing what you can, and, and sometimes that's, you know, that's frankly all we can do, particularly when, um, you know, our uh, responsibilities have us pulled in a lot of different directions, not all of which, you know, relate to collections management. We have another question, um, which I'll just go ahead and read. What are the rules about scanning materials in the library's collection and making them available on the web? Do you need to get permission from the donor first, et cetera? Um, so that goes back to the issues of um, intellectual property. So if you are, um, ideally, if you are um, uh, talking with the donor, talking about them, giving you your collection. You want to be very upfront with them about, about copyright. Um, if they transfer their copyright to uh, the libraries, uh, some donors do, some don't. Um, if they do transfer, that that means you are able to uh, you know, digitize and, and make those uh, materials available. If they, if they retain their copyright, then it's a little trickier, but um, um, whether it's uh, an in-house project that you want to work on or if it's somebody you know, outside of your library, a researcher who's interested in uh, using that material uh, uh, for publication or you know, otherwise uh, reproducing it, uh, it's important to, again, maintain that relationship with the donor and you can go back to that donor and, uh, and, and say, this is a... Uh, this is a request that comes in, um, and we would like, you know, we recommend that you uh, honor it. Um, I've I've seen it work a lot of different ways. Some donors uh, are not interested in transferring copyright, which makes um, things difficult. If if uh, your particular library is very interested in uh, undertaking digitization projects, and you feel it's uh, you know, more or less a requirement of donation that they transfer uh, copyright, and that's a consideration in whether or not you accept the collection. And I also want to mention that, that there is a lot to say about rights and accessibility, and we will be I'm in the process of planning a future webinar on that very same topic, but that, you know, part of what I do with HomePlace is consult with libraries and help them come to a decision about what we can safely put online. Um, and, you know, a lot of times it's just a question of, of managing risk, and um, that's a decision that, that we can, you know, certainly talk about and, and sort of see what the pluses and what the minuses are and, and what the course of action is if, if, you know, somebody takes issue with what we've put online. Yeah. Any other questions out there? Okay. Well, I have one last question I'll ask Matt, and that is um, one thing I've seen in, in the libraries that I've visited thus far uh, is almost every library that has a genealogy or local history collection will have scrapbooks. Yes. And um, they are, they can be wonderful, they can be really complicated. And uh, I guess I'm wondering um, if you have any sort of general suggestions for how to um, handle donations of scrapbooks um, and how you might, uh, you know, make those available to patrons. Um, yeah, yeah, I have a, a couple thoughts about that. So I think one thing that, you know, I think one thing in when evaluating a, a scrapbook is really looking at two things. What is the content of that scrapbook? And what is the condition of that scrapbook? Um, most of the, most of the uh, scrapbooks that have come my way have been a mix of some that are in just horrendous condition and then some that are in relatively good condition. They, you know, they use good adhesives and they, you know, use the good binding. And, um, um, and so, you know, I, I think I think from the standpoint of a scrapbook that might not be in very good shape, you know, you'll have to decide whether or not you want to take on that scrapbook and you know, if 
you, because the issue is, you know, how can you provide access to it if providing access to it is only going to provide, you know, to, to uh, uh, cause it to deteriorate more over time. Um, and you know, if you don't have um, if you don't have the resources to uh, um, don't have the resources to invest in any sort of preservation measures or conservation measures, then um, it might be something that you may not consider uh, accepting. But again, that's a conversation with the donor too to say you know, if the donor really thinks that this is a that the content of this is very valuable, and that, you know, and I think letting them know, well, you know, if people use this, it's going to deteriorate over time. That's a thing to let the donor be aware of. Yeah. I'm, as I mentioned a number of times in, in my uh, uh, talk, uh, I think transparency is extremely important. And so letting donors know, letting the public know how you, you know, what you do and how you do it, I think is always uh, important at, at every, you know, every level and every interaction. Agreed. Well, uh, it looks like there are no more questions at this point. So, Matt, I will um, just thank you for this excellent presentation and thank all of our participants for attending. Um, you will be receiving a link to the webinar recording as soon as it becomes available, probably around a week. And uh, you may now go ahead and disconnect the call. Thank you.